Hi, everyone. Welcome to our um, next breakout session. I'm really excited about this session. I, I'll tell you how it came to be. Um, we last year, about a year ago, uh, I got a work group together to talk about uh, what need, what do we need to do um, around prevention in terms of, of what's going on in the current research and um, what needs to be disseminated to universities um, in, a, in a way that's quick, that happens quickly. And so um, I asked Leigh Sloboda, who will be here with us um, in a bit, to help me organize this work group. And, and we had like every very important um, prevention researcher uh, in the world, I think, in, in, in participate in this work, work group. And so we have a few of them here today that are going to talk about some of the things that we discussed in that work group. Um, so I'll first start with uh, Dean Fixen, who hopefully you saw yesterday as our keynote on implementation science. Um, he is the director of the Active Implementation Research Network and has been doing implementation research for um, many, many years. And I will just turn it over to him without any further ado. Dean. Thank you, Kim, very much. The, uh, uh, I want to talk about the normalization of prevention principles and practices and a research agenda. So this, uh, the focus here is on the research agenda uh, part of things. So the, uh, always like this quote from Buckminster Fuller, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So we'll keep that in mind. So creating standard practice, the change this a bit, but normalization is a good frame for making innovative practices. I mean, the, these are the effective new things that we're trying to do and having them become standard practices. So this is what we do every day. So the take the innovation out and have it be the standard. Well, in active implementation, we think of normalization as sustaining and scaling effective implementation supports for effective practices in increasingly enabling context so that improved outcomes uh, are the norm. So here we have the formula for success with effective innovations, effective implementation, enabling context, uh, all factors in a multiplication formula. And if all factors are working as we intend, uh, then we can achieve socially significant outcomes. So, but notice it's multiplication. So none of those factors can be zero. And if any of those is uh, weak, uh, then the chances of achieving socially significant outcomes uh, is reduced. So creating standard uh, practices is really what we're looking for for normalization. So normalization research uh, here's a testable prediction. So for researchers, for uh, scientists uh, looking at these problems, uh, here are the implementation drivers uh, for developing competency, for changing organizations, and having the leadership uh, in place to have all of this happen. So the, the uh, factors that you need to keep in mind is that fidelity in this formula uh, is an outcome of the implementation drivers used effectively. So if we're training uh, and preparing and coaching uh, the uh, practitioners to uh, do the innovation that we're talking about, uh, and we have the organization uh, drivers in place, we have the leadership drivers in place, those things combine, they're integrated and compensatory, as it says, uh, then we're going to have high fidelity uh, outcomes for practitioners. But those that high fidelity then is the input for using innovations effectively. So high fidelity uh, practitioners are consistent uses, users of innovations. They reliably produce the benefits that we intend uh, for the people who are participating uh, in the various. Uh, so the prediction then is that normalization is the product of effective innovations supported by effective implementation at scale and over time. So to normalize something, these are the factors that we can assess. And here is a testable prediction uh, for our research projects. So as you can tell, 
To normalize is to change. Few organizations can fully use an innovation without, in essence, forming a new organization so that fledgling ideas are not crushed <clears throat> by the established routines. <clears throat> Norton Tucker, a wonderful book that they wrote uh, in 1987, but they were summarizing their experience in uh, getting innovations uh, installed into uh, organizations. But the the fledgling ideas are crushed by the established routines <clears throat> unless the organization itself changes. Uh, in our own research, uh, we found that in status quo organizations that are already producing less than desirable results, it is assumed that the status quo will need to change to create a hospitable organization environment in which the innovation can thrive and become standard practice the new status quo. So to normalize is to change. We have to take what is we have right now and change it into what needs to be uh, in the future and then to have that be the new standard. So changing to a new normal uh, is a lot of work and it's a lot of work over uh, several years. So that we have leadership that thoughtfully disrupts the status quo, thoughtfully disrupts the status quo, manages change, consistently supports the development of the new things that need to be in place. The integrated selection, training, coaching, fidelity assessment to assure those consistent uses of effective innovations, facilitative administration, administrators that can't wait to find the next way to support practitioners using the innovation. But facilitative administrators routinely remove impediments and improve supports for practitioners using the innovation. Decision support data systems collect, analyze, report consistent fidelity outcome and process data. So we're, we're making, we're collecting the data in a consistent way, analyzing it frequently, reporting it to the people who can use it to make uh, good decisions. And, of course, leadership that assures continuous improvement of impl implementation supports for practitioners. But notice leadership here really is focusing on the improvement of implementation supports. Uh, the innovation itself is something that is an evidence-based program, an evidence-based practice. It's uh, motivational interviewing. It's whatever it is that you're attempting to use. But the use of that really depends on those implementation drivers that we looked at uh, uh, earlier. So here's an example of fidelity. Fidelity is that link between the inputs and outputs uh, that we looked at in our, uh, our research uh, prediction. But here, here is school-wide positive uh, behavioral interventions and supports. Uh, PBIS uh, uh, is a well-established uh, evidence-based uh, approach to reducing uh, disruptive behavior in schools, and it's uh, been around since the 1990s. But here, these are data from 5,331 schools, and the good thing here is that fidelity is being assessed uh, in this uh, formula uh, every year. So at the bottom there, you have year one, two, three, four, five uh, of uh, their attempt in these schools to make use of PBIS. But notice that for a normalization point of view, it, having this innovation, PBIS as an innovation becomes standard practice. Uh, it's the ones who were able to uh, establish high fidelity use of PBIS and sustain it for two years or more, uh, th this then became the new normal. Those schools now had a new way of being uh, and a new way of interacting with the students, uh, and the students then were benefiting from PBIS. But having data like these, uh, this is a way to start to assess, are we accomplishing our goals? Are we able to produce uh, the consistent uh, benefits to the beneficiaries, students in this case, uh, and are we able to sustain that over time so that it can become the new normal? Here's a uh, graph, uh, very busy, and I will explain this to you. 
But uh, this was a large organization that was making use of the teaching family model. Uh, another evidence-based uh, program uh, started in the 1960s and 70s. And the fidelity score on the left-hand side, uh, here it goes from three to seven on the scale. The little box is around six. So the goal for fidelity uh, was to have the practitioners achieve a six on a seven-point scale. Along the bottom, you see year four, 4.5. So every six months, we were summarizing the data for fidelity. And so uh, it took four years to change the uh, organization. It was an institutional uh, program, and we changed it into teaching family homes for kids to, to benefit them. But notice that uh, the data are there for uh, the the practitioners who had been employed for zero to six months, and you see the score there is pretty low, uh, below a four is not a very desirable score at all. Uh, then we have the couples who had been there for seven to 12 months, and then one year, two years, and three or more years. So those, those are the bars that you see going across uh, and being summarized every, every six months. So the interesting thing is, from a normalization point of view, the, the, the practitioners who were there three or more years, they, of course, were doing very well. They had had the benefit of training. They had had coaching uh, every month and more frequently as needed uh, for the entire time that they were uh, working in their, their teaching family home. So their scores were right around the, the six mark that we were aspiring to. The big difference in the normalization part of things happened for the people who were new. These are the, this is the zero to six month group. They were just hired, they were just went through training, they're just getting started with the coaching, uh, just learning how to use the teaching family model to interact with the, uh, the uh, adolescent uh, boys and girls over time uh, that uh, were in their charge. But going from a, a 3.5 or 4 score in year four, but in the last few years, uh, the new people were at a score of five or better on the seven-point scale, which is quite good. So what this is telling us is that the supports that were there for new people learning how to do this work, those supports were getting better and better over time. And uh, I can tell you that uh, the teaching family model in this organization became the new normal. And here we are ending at year nine, but uh, this organization still is using the teaching family model. Uh, and 37 years later, uh, it is for sure uh, the normal. So collect fidelity data uh, as your metric uh, to see, are we accomplishing what we set out to accomplish and then use those fidelity data as we did here uh, to improve the supports for people uh, quickly learning uh, what to do, how to do it, and to do it with good good impact uh, and outcomes for the, the teenagers in this particular case. So to normalize, we think about this as normalizing outcomes. Uh, we want the improved outcomes to be the uh, the thing that uh, is the new normal. So the use of an innovation with fidelity and the use of the implementation drivers with fidelity, so all the things uh, that are there on that triangle, these things together produce reliable benefits uh, that we want to become the new norm. So uh, thank you very much, and I will stop there and happy to have questions later on. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dean. Um, so we so we'll go on to our next presenter. We'll have uh, questions and answers at the end. I would like to introduce um, Denny Fishbein, who is the director of translational of the translational neuroprevention research or of translational neuroprevention research at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 
She's also a professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies and the director of the Program of Translational Research on Adversity and Neurodevelopment at Pennsylvania State University. And um, she also has a very long and illustrious career, and I'm not going to get into all of the details, but you can, um, you can tell she's got an interesting research perspective. And so, Denny, I'm going to turn it over to you. How is that coming? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go there yet. Okay. Let me move this out of the way. So, um, hi everybody. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for joining this panel. I will also mention that I'm I direct the um, National Prevention Science Coalition to Improve Lives, um, and uh, and you can find us at www.mpscoalition.org org if you're interested in what we do. Um, so I'm going to talk, um, so I'm going to like go expand upon what Dean has said. Dean has provided a wonderful foundation for what I'll be talking about, but I'm not going to talk about interventions. I'm going to talk about what the active ingredients are of interventions. And so I'm going to start with this uh, just very, very quickly. I'm not going to go into detail with this, but this is a model that we developed in 2016. It's published in Translational Behavioral Medicine. And we developed this model specifically for the field of prevention science. Many of the translational models out there come from psychiatry, psychology, environmental science, uh, biobehavioral medicine, and so forth. Nothing was truly specifically for prevention science, nor did I feel that it covered all the bases. So I wanted to compel prevention scientists to think about ways that they can take the basic research and, and hold hands with other researchers to, um, to move the science, to move the science to the next phase. Um, and with the first phase being T0, that's the first, the zero stage of translation, the basic science. And with an understanding of the mechanisms of the phenomena that we study, how can that inform the way we develop programs and then subsequently optimize them to exert the largest effects? So the basic science really provides a blueprint for program development if T1 scientists are looking towards that basic science, which can be neuroscience, it can be epidemiology, it can be social behavioral science, it can be genetics. So the whole range, just as long as we're looking at the underlying mechanisms of the phenomena we wish to prevent. Developing programs based on that information and then going to T2, which are really our effectiveness and, and efficacy trials. Um, and here is where we identify who's responding to interventions and who's not. And we want to know who's not so that we can refine interventions to work better and spread a wider net. So we take that information, we go back to the basic science in a back translational process, and we determine where the heterogeneity is coming from. We refine, we try again. Once we feel good, we have significant effect sizes for our, um, for our interventions. Then we take them to T3, where we do comparative effectiveness trials in real world settings. So it is here that we look at these more personalized approaches that have been informed by the basic science and we compare them with standard interventions that have not been refined to see which works better. Once we feel good about that, and we, things are working well in real world settings that are culturally adaptive and developmentally appropriate and so on. Then we go to T4. And this was largely where Dean was, was talking. And this is how Dean has been absolutely instrumental in the field and, um, and determining how to best institutionalize interventions that have been shown to work well, because you can have great interventions, but if they only work in a research setting under really strict protocols, they're not going to work well in systems and in communities and so forth, where fidelity falls apart and the implementation process has low quality. And so this needs a great deal of attention. But what I'm going to be talking about is primarily T5. Nobody talks about that a lot. <laughs> and so I'm going to kind of tease it apart a little bit what these interventions are really about. Um, here is where we refine, reform universal social systems. So here is where we embed 
the principles and practices that are ingredients of good interventions, and we embed them into mindsets and systems and policies. So I just wanted to set that up so that when I say T1 or T4, T5, you can re- think back to this model. So what is the bread and butter of prevention? Basically, you know, prevention research has been historically focused on the development of interventions, their implementation, and their scaling. So development T1, implementation T2, and scaling T3. I'm being, I'm simplifying. Okay, that's what prevention has largely been focusing on as a field. The success of this agenda has been remarkable. So we have interventions that that are mapped to every developmental stage from conception to early adulthood. And they have been shown to exert significant effect sizes. So this is the, the success of prevention science is really um, something that we should be applauded and recognized and appreciated. And yet. Most people don't know what prevention is. Most people don't know what there's science to it. But I have to say that in this day and age, the time is now for prevention because unfortunately and tragically, this pandemic has brought the role of prevention to the fore in a number of fields, not only with respect to how the virus spreads, how it's contracted and so forth, and how it can be prevented, but also with respect to the disparities that we have across societies that the pandemic is impacting in a disproportionate way. So we we are now starting to understand the role of prevention and what public health really is about. Increasing and sustaining the impacts of what prevention has generated can be achieved in two ways, by broadening the scope and scale of these interventions. Um, Dean talked about that. And identifying or developing effective methods that advance the institutionalization of those interventions that are most effective and that are generalizable. And Dean focused a great deal in that. That's where his work has been really instrumental in moving the field forward. So I'm not going to be talking about that. <laughs> um, and I just want to say that the constraint has for, for prevention science has been that that the you know our research process is really dictated by time limited grants. So you do this great thing. You're in a school system p- with PBIS or with the Good Behavior Game or with the PAS. Uh, protocol or any of these other prevention systems, and and you do great work, and people benefit, and children are children you thrive, and teachers love it because it's positively reinforcing, and then the grant ends, and researchers move on, which is what the frustration was for me, and why I wanted to develop this translational model. How can we get these things to be sustained over time outside of the grant process? And so the culture of prevention, we would contend in this panel, is an alternative to this. And it's otherwise known as normalizing prevention. It's where we're really seeding it throughout communities and throughout systems and policies. There are basically two approaches to normalizing prevention. The first is T4, if you recall T4, to target entire communities. And this has to do with strengthening and scaling the implementation process. Dean spoke to that. I'm going to speak to T5, which is reforming universal social systems. This is a globalization process where we change minds, and I'll explain that in a minute. We change minds We change the way people interact with each other on the basis of what we know about how interventions work, right? What are the underlying principles and practices? Again, I'll explain in a minute. So we change the way we interact with each other with between adults and with our children. We change systems and how they work and how they're able to take up interventions and systematize them, if you will, uh, in their delivery, and we change policies so they can be as sustained and that they're supported not only by governing bodies at all levels, but by policies within administrations, um, school, public health uh, administrations, uh, healthcare, juvenile justice, et cetera, et cetera. What are the drivers of normalization? The first driver is increasing knowledge. 
Changing attitudes and mindsets really extend from a fundamental, a fundamental understanding of the science of human development and the importance of the manner in which adults interact with each other and how they interact with our children. And understanding these processes and how they work, how a parent's touch, how a parent's smile, you know, all of these things, every interaction we have with a child affects their development. And having the public understand this is absolutely critical to moving this knowledge forward. Then making this knowledge widely accessible, and that has the potential to catalyze change in attitudes and behaviors. And the recipients of this information then can become change agents themselves, okay? And then they just diffuse that information to their associates, to organizations and systems with, within which they interact, and they disseminate it throughout their own spheres of influence. So the end goal is to spur a shift in cultures in, and our priorities and the practices that in turn influence policies, the distribution of resources to increase equity in these practices and system level relationships. Um, and just as, you know, for example, incorporating these principles and these practices into cross sector service delivery systems substantially expands the scale at which benefits can be achieved. Okay, and then incorporating the principles and practices that undergird intervention impacts into our daily lives is the second driver of normalization. This can transform the way adults interact with each other and, it, and the way they interact with their children, as I said previously. And these fundamental units of interventions have been shown to experimentally in influence specific behavior. So in, in research, it has really looked at the underlying active ingredients, the principles and practices that make up interventions. And they're, you know, in many respects, common across all preventive interventions. Um, they have been experimentally shown to, to influence the, our targets, what we're interested in changing, right? The, the underlying mechanisms of behaviors that we want to prevent. Also, integrating a wide range of these practices and principles into our daily interactions has the potential to broadly and sustainably promote health and well-being, independent of any intervention or grant. And so the ultimate effects are a more equitable playing field for our children. Benefits of embedding active ingredients include the following. So we're talking active ingredients, kernels, practices, and I'll give you some examples in a second. Uh, practices and other program components can be incorporated into our mindsets, our interactions, and our system level practices um, easily without having to be embedded in an intervention, an intervention that, that they tend to be, and Dean is, like I said, transforming this, but they tend to be in a specific community, in a specific school system, in a, in a set of households, and it's, you know, so they only have these very limited effects where wherever the researcher or wherever the system is that has taken up that intervention, it does not necessarily have a large scale impact. But here we can potentially have that with normalization. So to the extent that we have identified them and their ability to impact family functioning, child development and community health. So we, we need more information about this. I'll explain in a minute. These active ingredients are adaptable to multiple settings. They can be taken up culturally in different ways and so forth, just as long as they're true to the underlying principle. Um, they are accommodating of cultural and community characteristics, preferences, and needs because they're not set, you know, protocols for an intervention. It extends beyond that. And then they are infinitely adoptable on an individual or systems level. And finally, they have greater potential to exert population level effects than single interventions. 
So I'm going to give you some examples very, very quickly. I'm not going to go into any of these, but many of you have, may have heard of the Absidarian approach. Um, yes, it was developed by the institute in which I now work, but I had nothing to do with it. Um, but I think it's fabulous. Um, it is used all over the world, um, and it concerns the quality of adult and child interactions. It's what the Yale um the, sorry, Yale, the Harvard Center on the Developing Child refers to as the serve and return approach. And so here you have, you know, very frequent and intentional occurrences in four contexts. So this just gives you an idea, I can move this out of the way, of how these kinds of practices, yes, the absidarian approach is considered an intervention, but it really isn't. It's really a set of principles and practices. So it prioritizes language and provides opportunities for developing language in children, which is essential to their executive develop, cognitive development. Enriches caregiving, conversational reading, and learning games are the four components of the absidarian approach. And if you look carefully at this approach, you see what the those principles are that can be literally adopted by anybody. And what is the evidence? Just, you know, you can look at this slide. There's a there's improvement in all these domains on the left. There's a decrease in depression, smoking and drug use, welfare use, adolescent parenthood, and so forth. So the evidence is extremely strong. It has been studied for 40 years now. Another example is the PAX Good Behavior Game. And just very quickly, um, these components of the, or the active ingredients and as they are referred to, the kernels of the Good Behavior Game, which is a, a universal school-based approach, are here on the left in blue. And the type of kernel, in other words, what they act on is just to the right of that. Um, and then if you don't mind, the other columns refer to inhibitory control, executive cognitive function, emotion regulation, error monitoring, and reward sensitivity. Because I do brain stuff. So I was inter I'm interested in how the kernels of the good behavior game have an impact on these. And so we need to do more work, but this is a program that can be broken down into its essential components. And here is the evidence. Okay, so good stuff happens in the first three months, all the way up to 15 years later, where we have less bad stuff and more good stuff in terms of outcomes for children who receive this. We've also learned about practices to promote self-regulation. And without going into any of them, I've really just listed them here so you know that we have consistently found that these practices that can be practiced by anyone can improve self-regulation in children. And we're actually looking at these now to see if they improve brain function. So there's a lot of research that's needed. I'm probably out of time. I'm not really sure. No, Kim says no. Okay, so please, um, you know, get the cane out um, when I'm done. <laughs> um, so the research that's needed first is we need to use adaptive designs like the multi- phase optimization strategy, which is called MOST, and also SMART, because what they do is they pull apart interventions to see what, what are the ingredients that are most potent in affecting the underlying mechanisms of what we want to prevent. And so they start with understanding the mechanisms and then build the intervention around that. These are incredibly great research strategies to begin to move this normalization process forward. We're also applying the science of implementation to determine best practices and the quality of their implementation, which was covered by Dean Fixon. Um, I am extremely a strong advocate for using the latest uh, science from communication. The this, this science of communication has advanced in leaps and bounds in recent years. I would implore you to look at frameworksinc.org. I think it's .org, it's either .org or .com. They have done incredible work in determining how best to construct messaging frames to reach audiences of interest from different public audiences, different subgroups, different demographics, to clinicians, to um, all kinds of end users, but importantly for me anyway, is to be able to communicate with policymakers. 
because it takes special strategies to know how to get this kind of knowledge across to policymakers. And I believe it's essential that we influence policy in order to sustain prevention in a way that's truly embedded in systems. Okay, so then how to build political will in large part through the way we communicate, but we also need to, there's going to be a lot of how questions now, okay, and then I'm done. But how do we build political will? Um, and we're trying to develop methodologies to, to do that. What works best? What messaging frames works best? What content, how to make that content accessible to political bodies, to governing bodies? What is the best way? We, you know, we have to figure out not just what works, like that that's going on, what works intervention-wise and practice and principle-wise, but you know, that's going on while we try to build the political will to take up these strategies. Another uh, way we need, another, you know, avenue for research, if you will, is how to build community coalitions to cr increase political influence. This is extremely important. People like Sarah Chalinsky at the, at Penn State and others are working on how to build uh, community coalitions and are also looking at how to increase their political influence so that constituents are talking to their lawmakers directly. And then how, another how, how do we build educational curricula and systems that embody the, these principles and practices and ingredients and, and kernels from interventions so, so we can build them in? You know, how can we get educational systems, not just to take up an intervention, but to take up what a curriculum looks like when teachers and, and children and students are really developing a, a school climate that is, that is, oh, sorry, my dog is here. <laughs> They're building a school climate that um, is conducive to learning, that is con conducive to uh, managing classrooms that, that are very rewarding to, to teachers, but also that help to improve the student's ability to learn and engage in a social environment. Principles, it's not just about, uh, about interventions. And then how do we build these practices into systems so that they're sustainable? And that's what we're interested in. That's what Dean is interested in. And it's another how-to question that research needs to address. And then finally, how do we engage scientists in the advocacy process? So this is what my coalition, that's why I wanted to mention the National Prevention Science Coalition to improve lives because we're training scientists to engage in advocacy with their policymakers. And it does take uh, specialized communication skills and an understanding of the policy process, but it's absolutely essential because if scientists don't engage in the advocacy process, then they will be, the policies will be dictated by vested interests and people without an understanding of the science from prevention science. So I'm going to stop there and thank you so much for your patience. Appreciate it. Thanks, Denny. Um, uh, so I, a couple things, I, I put the link to the website for the, um, the National Prevention, Prevention Science Coalition in the chat, so everyone has that. Um, we resolved the technical difficulties, and Zilli Sloboda is here, and so I'm going to briefly introduce her so that she can then introduce uh, Harry Sumnall, and then she can sort of facilitate the final discussion. So I think I think everyone knows Zilli, and she probably uh, does need to be introduced, but in case you don't know her, she's the president of the Applied Prevention Sciences International. She, um, she has previously worked at um, NIDA as the director of the Division of Epidemiology and Prevention Research. She's uh, held academic positions in a couple universities, at least two, maybe three, um, multiple universities. And she is, um, she's also the founder of both the United States and the EU Societies for Prevention Research. So she's just um, done so much for prevention in our, um, in, for addiction, but prevention in general. And so I'm gonna turn this over to you, Zilly. Thank you for your patience with our technical issues and um, you can introduce Harry and, Take it from here. Well, thank you. Um, the support staff was really helpful, and they were very patient with me. Um, I don't know what the problem was, but uh, it was very frustrating. However, it does give me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Harry. 
Harry Sumner. Um, Harry is a professor um, in substance use at the Public Health Institute at the Liverpool John Moores University in the United Kingdom. Hi, thanks very much, Silly. I uh, hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, it's a very kind introduction and glad to see you again on screen. Uh, so I'll be following up the two previous speakers, maybe taking a slightly different perspective because I'm not an implementation scientist, but I am somebody who's very passionate about prevention science and who works with policy makers and decision makers. And I'm also somebody who leads university courses around prevention and addictions as well. So I was approaching this particular <clears throat> panel today thinking about, well, what are some of the key discussion points around normalization? And what are some of the research gaps that perhaps we could be thinking about? And I really liked uh, Diana's point about this concept of embedding prevention and prevention work in universal provision, because certainly in many countries, including my own, the UK, I think this is perhaps the way that prevention is moving. Uh, I think sometimes here in Europe, we look across to the USA, very much a focus on prevention programs and implementation and refinement of programs. And that doesn't really mirror the type of prevention activity which takes place in many countries in the world. And I know that sometimes we have a rose tinted view of about what happens in the USA. Uh, but I think in terms of uh, it, delivery of prevention, particularly within Europe, then we need to ask some different questions about normalization and implementation as well. And one of the, the, the issues I'm particularly interested in, and I don't necessarily have answers to this, uh, this is something I hope we, we will uh, explore within the panel today, is how do we normalize prevention activities when there's no recognizable prevention systems? Uh, and by prevention systems, uh, that, that can be on a national level or even on a local level. But I would argue that certainly here in Europe, and maybe in contrast to other areas of health and social care, and certainly in contrast to the treatment sector and the harm reduction sector, there's very little structured uh, system support around prevention. So this poses a big challenge. How do we actually normalize? How do we reach professionals who are doing this sort of work when there's no recognized set of prevention activity taking place? And if we think about some of the most influential documents and reports and guidelines, particularly in, in Europe, then this, this reinforces this perspective as well. Uh, yes, we do have some isolated examples of structured and well-managed approaches such as communities that care. There's been some pilots in the Netherlands, in Germany, in the UK, for example. But these sorts of structured systems-led approaches to the planning and delivery of prevention are very rare indeed in Europe. But we do have a lot of very good evidence and really good guidance around not necessarily programmed approaches, but key principles of effective prevention. Some of those nuggets that were mentioned before. And the challenge is how do we, how do we first Firstly, how do we disseminate this and how do we embed this type of activity? Because this, in my view, is the sort of guidance and documentations that the majority of uh, practitioners, certainly in Europe, will be working with and familiar with. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the international standards on drug use prevention uh, and some great implementation work taking place, particularly in low and middle income countries, some really useful work there. Uh, there's the exchange registry, published by the uh, European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction, may be focused on programmatic approaches, so in terms of implementation and relevance to many European countries, some questions there. But the example, I think, of the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence in the UK is illustrative. So this is an example of the sort of uh, activities and guidance that uh, I, I, I referred to before. So the work of NICE, if you're not familiar with it, is to provide evidence-based guidance. It's, it's based upon systematic reviews of evidence and health economics. But a key part of this guidance is the implementation. 
And the key thing about the NICE guidance is that they never recommend, certainly in the prevention field, is that they never recommend particular programmatic approaches. They recommend principles of prevention, how you go about delivering and applying prevention, not full programmatic approaches. And similar guidance from the EMCDBA as well. So uh, uh, a very comprehensive document published a couple of years ago, uh, responding from a health and social perspective to drug problems. And I think where you don't have these robust prevention systems in place, it's still worth, I think, mapping out within your own country or in, indeed in your own locality, an idealised prevention system. Uh, this is work that the EMCDDA did a couple of years ago, led by Gregor Burkhardt and colleagues who, who many of you might know from the EU prevention field. And this was trying to map out the key components of idealised prevention systems. So, so under the understanding and recognition that there might not be robust and official structures and organisations where these take place, but all of these particular components within the system are relevant. So, for example, just to talk you through this system approach and a few examples as well. So this particular model, it, it tries to persuade us to move away from interventions, although that is central to the model. It asks us to take a step back and almost from a, if you're from a public health background such as myself, almost from a socio-ecological perspective to try and understand those societal and national level influences on prevention work which is taking place. So the so-called moderators of prevention, now this can include policy, but can also include social interpretations and social norms around behaviours of interest and of prevention approaches. So as a very, very uh, uh, easy and obvious example, if you have a particular policy environment, which is very accommodating and maybe uh, taking a liberal view towards substance use. So in many parts of the world, we now have new legislation around cannabis use, for example, then a societal perspective on prevention is going to be very different from other countries which have a more traditional and prohibitionary approach to those substances. And this is going to be reflected not just in substance use policy, the laws and regulations surrounding that, but perhaps also in those activities which support prevention policy as well health and social care policy, uh, police funding, police responses, all things like that. And I think uh, a really important research question, and there's certainly gaps around this, is what does the public actually think about prevention? What are appropriate prevention responses? And how has this changed, particularly in relation to some of those legislative changes that I've, I've spoken about? Other aspects of the pro uh, projects, and there's been some really interesting European Union funded research around this. Uh, I was involved for many years in developing quality standards in prevention. And the idea of these quality standards was not necessarily to look at programmatic approaches, not necessarily looking at quality standards in intervention delivery, but how we actually organise and implement prevention activities, really focusing on issues from the ethics of prevention, looking at workforce issues, professionalisation and professional culture, but how we organise and deliver prevention activities, not just within specialised services, but moving across to other areas of health and social care as well. And this reminds me of some interesting work that was done and published in the journal Drug and Education, uh, Drugs Education Prevention and Policy a couple of years ago, which tried to map out and examine uh, uh, prevention and drug treatment workforce and professional specialisation and actually argued that attempts to professionalise the workforce, certainly in Europe, had largely failed because those specialisations were subordinate to uh, primary professional identities, whether that was a clinician or a psychiatrist or a social worker. So I think quality standards can help us think about professionalisation in a different way. And the recently completed EPIC quality standards, for example, is a really good example of this sort of work in the criminal justice system. 
some very new approaches with the ASAP training uh, initiative, which I think is ongoing or it might be coming to an end. I need, I need to double check that. And this was directly working with prevention professionals and decision makers, et cetera, trying to understand and trying to understand the gaps in their skills around prevention and try to normalize and embed those prevention principles, particularly in non-specialist workforce. It's in a brand new initiative and it's so new that it's not even got its own logo yet, is the, the Phoenix uh, Initiative, which is specifically looking at this interaction between interventions, the workforce, cooperation across sectors, including the specialised and non-specialised workforce, and how quality standards are implemented at a local level. So certainly in Europe, some really interesting work that's taking place, which might help us to understand normalisation. <clears throat> but for this panel, I think, where we're thinking about research gaps and a research agenda, I think a major research gap with all, despite all of this fantastic European work is, has this made a difference? Has this actually made a difference with regards to the quality and content of prevention policy, prevention practice, and prevention outcomes? I think we've done some fantastic work uh, trying to understand the issue, some of the parameters of the issue, but what difference does it make for target groups, the health and well-being of populations? Major research gaps there, and I think that's probably the next phase and I certainly hope that our research agendas incorporate these big questions. And so some of the, uh, the work that I've been involved in or just begun to get involved in is uh, uh, some interesting projects looking at the sports doping field and the human enhancement drug field, which is a, a new area for me. But, but this is an interesting field because this is primarily delivered by non-specialists uh, in Europe, it's uh, it's it's it, although you could say it relates to substance use. It's typical; these are activities typically delivered by, for example, pharmacists, uh, by fitness instructors, gym owners, uh, other people involved in fitness and sports. So we we've undertaken uh, some interesting work looking at prevention needs and quasi professionalization of these sorts of non traditional groups. And uh, we're early, early days of this sort of research, but we've been trying to understand, well, what sort of interventions do you need, if I can call them interventions in inverted commas, to change the mindset and uh, perceptions of this non-specialist workforce? And unsurprisingly, very, very little work from a European perspective out there. But during this work, we've actually, uh, we've looked to the health behaviour change literature to see whether those key learning and key outcomes from intervention research, the mechanisms of behaviour change, can actually be uh, adapted from trying to change health behaviours of target populations to be actually used to change uh, the professional activities of this non-specialist workforce who make important contributions to non-specialist prevention systems. <clears throat> and I, I just want to highlight some some areas that we found interesting and perhaps are worth exploring in a bit more detail in future research. So, so for example, in, in the health uh, behaviour workforce in general, Health Scotland produced some really interesting guidance around competencies in non-specialist professionals. And this is not so much focused on specialist activities around programmes and interventions, but developing competencies and capacities in order to be able to adapt and implement interventions in an evidence-informed way in order to change those and adapt those for local populations and local needs where there might not already be a substantial evidence base for that particular target population. And that requires a great skill. Uh, some of these uh, approaches require real skills and competence in order to do that, because essentially you're tinkering with the fundamental mechanisms of some of these interventions. But some interesting work there, and I think some learning perhaps for the drugs prevention field. Uh, 
other work which is uh, which has looked at uh, how looked at knowledge transfer processes has actually found that some of these key factors again which change target population behaviors around health and social behaviors actually are really important when we consider professional behaviors around professional learning and knowledge transfer but again you know some unique and intriguing suggestions here but can we do some more work about how we actually tap into these drivers of professional behavior change as well. Can we build upon these? And something which I've utilized in, the, in those projects, which I mentioned before about sports doping, is drawing upon existing models and theories, robust theories of behavior change. So we've done a bit of work around the theoretical domains framework, uh, which is a, a simplification uh, uh, well, I used simplification in its broadest sense. It tries, it's tried to construct and consolidate uh, 33 different theories, 128 different constructs, which explain at a fundamental level behavior change. And again, that's tended to focus on health and social behaviors, but can we do some research and actually apply this to professional behavior as well? There's been even more simplification and consolidation around this with the, uh, the COM-B model of Susan Mickey and colleagues, which are very, very influential in health behaviour change field. But I think there's probably scope to use some of these key principles in the professional knowledge transfer field as well. And something which intrigues me, uh, which perhaps requires a bit more more work and I think is very relevant to the theme of the discussion today, is Carl May. Carl Mays and uh, uh, Emily Finch's normalization process theory. So this is trying to understand how practice and interventions is embedded on a routine day-to-day -day level where it becomes normalized and it becomes invisible. And again, some really great work. I think uh, systematic reviews and scoping reviews have shown that, that this sort of theory has been used hundreds of times, particularly in health and social care, but less in the prevention field. So what is the work, as, as Carl May describes it, that needs to be done to normalize activity so it becomes second nature? And I think this theoretical perspective could be an interesting way of looking at this from the prevention perspective. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, here. So we will have a few minutes. I want to um, give Silly just a few minutes to um, comment on the presentations. And there are a couple questions already that we'll get to. And if you have questions, please do put them in the Q&A box. Silly? Well, I want to thank the panel. My, I mean, we've all talked about these issues before, but I think you did a to, I was you know, concerned about how we were going to convince everything, and you did a fantastic, fantastic job. Um, I think people, I think what the message that each of you have given, a different perspective on this issue, uh, underscores the complexity of it. We're talking about different goals, we're talking about different target groups, we're talking about um, different uh, uh, systems that we need to degrade, et cetera. And um, so that research is needed at, at several different levels. And there, uh, the members of the panel are also part of a group that Kim and I are working on. Kim may have mentioned it earlier. Um, we're trying to develop a paper to summarize some of this and you can see how difficult it is. Um, but uh, I also wanted to, I uh, meant to mention, Harry, by the way, your work on the European Drug Prevention Quality Standards, because I think that was a powerful tool for prevention professionals in the field. Uh, so um, I'm sorry I didn't mention that um, when I was introducing you. Actually, I had a long introduction, but I was worried about time. <laughs> um, anyway, I think we should open up to questions, Kim. Yeah, so so this I'm going to combine these. There's two separate questions, but they're kind of getting at the same issue. And Denny, I think this came up while you were presenting. Um, and the and the question is that you know a lot of this research is is sort of retros, um, retrospective, right? So we know what happened afterwards, and, and not necessarily prospective. And the question is. Um, in terms of it, I'm going to read it. In terms of expanding prevention to its basic principles, do you think we should prepare young couples? And then the other question is also people who are planning on adopting children. Um, 
uh, you know, prior to family formation on prevention modalities so that they are more prepared to deal with problems um, that they may uh, run into with their children as they become adolescents. Well, I, if you're asking for my opinion, <laughs> which <laughs> is all I can do at this point, um, I would say, I actually would prefer that we teach these principles in elementary school and middle school at the latest before people even think about having children. And that, you know, there, if we're really going to embed these principles into our mindsets, um, it's not, yes, training for, for young couples before they have children. Absolutely. I, I think it could be nothing but beneficial. And it certainly can be done with the, without values and without you know, it would not be value ridden. In other words, it would not be partisan at all. It would just be the basic prince, fundamental principles of what we know it takes for children to thrive and to be nurtured and develop um, and become successful adults um, with well-being and, and happiness and, and productivity. Right. We know we know those basic principles already. And the intervention work that prevention scientists have done have been able to really kind of delineate those components in a more specific way. Um, and they can be pulled out, as Harry was saying as well. Uh, there's a lot of convergence between our, our co uh, conversations, and I think he operationalized it extremely well. So um, I think that, that this should be a way of living um, and not, you know, an intervention or a training here or there. Um, but that it becomes part of our of our mantra, you know, the way we know it takes for us to interact with other adults in a civil in a civil way, in a way that is uh, productive and um, and considerate and caring and compassionate towards one another. And we should certainly behave in the same way towards our children. What prevention tells us is what those little kernels are you know what is it you know when when we raise our teenagers and they're you know off the wall and they're nuts and we can't we feel like we can't control them prevention science has actually shown us that and and actually psychology there's fundamental psychological principles is that let's not as adults impose our own feelings on others including our children at any age we have a tendency to say you know, um, you shouldn't feel like that, or it wasn't that bad. But we know from prevention that what we need to do is accept their feelings, commiserate with them, and talk it through so that they don't feel invalidated. I mean, these are that's just one kernel, right? There are hundreds of kernels like that about how we should interact with one another and with our children. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, we, maybe we need to start with training, for parents, but I also think if we're raised in a way that adopts these principles, the training becomes less necessary. Sort of a question about where do you break the cycle, right? I mean, that's kind of what that question gets to is like where where and maybe the answer is you you intervene in multiple places in the cycle. Um, well, you know, intervention implies that there's a process ongoing that needs to be intercepted, a negative process that requires intervention. If we're really thinking in a more fundamental way, um, we can help ch you know children to develop in a, in a way that's healthy and for them to thrive all along the way so there's less need to intercept. Now, certainly it doesn't eliminate it. There are going to be issues. Children come into the world with different temperaments and predispositions um, and systems don't always work and families aren't always supportive. And so I think we really need a complement of these practices um, and strategy, prevention strategies all along the way. Um, and I would just say, and I'll let others speak of course, but I don't think it's ever too late from a neurobiological perspective, the you know adolescence doesn't end until you're almost 30. And what that means for prevention is that there are multiple opportunities for intervention, right? Throughout, because the brain is malleable and plastic until you're almost 30, and then it's all over after now. <laughs> okay. You can change an adult brain within 12 weeks measurably with, with cognitive behavioral therapy as an example. 
Um, with mindfulness interventions, we have actually seen change in the brain. So you can imagine what we can do with the child's brain to, um, to help it overcome adversity in their prevailing environment and other uh, risk factors. Now, you, and you touch on something prevailing prevailing environment, and I think we're, we're, we, we don't certainly, from our my perspective, uh, in the United States, we don't have enough supports for families. And uh, a lot of our families are under stress, and even the best of parents may not be able to be as supportive of their children. So I think this gets back to my com comment before about how complex how complex this, this, these changes are, this whole normalization process is, is because it has to be multiple things have to be going on at the same time. And I think, I know, Denny, you've been doing a lot of work with your group in reaching policymakers. Uh, and I think you've been hopefully getting some success. <laughs> um, but I think we you really need to, uh, to, to look at the environment as well as the, the different components of the environment. That is uh, essential. I, I, to me, that's the priority because if the environment is a nurturing one with conditions that are conducive to healthy development, we don't have many of the problems that we deal with now, nor do we have the inequities that we deal with now. I think that might be a good place to end. I think that that's a I think that's a great place to end. So I so <laughs> we have so I I thank our panel. I thank um, the audience and um, appreciate the participation. And um, we will see you in the next session, which I think starts at uh, well quarter past the hour, whatever the hour is, um, in your location. So we'll see you shortly. Thank you. Thank you all. I so enjoyed this, Dean and Harry. Thank you. And thank you, Zilly and Kim. Great, great panel. Great panel. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.